Thank you for joining us this morning. We're very happy to see so many of you here with us at the SDG Media Zone. Please take a seat. So my name is Sherry Aldis. I'm the Chief of United Nations Publications at the UN in New York. And I would like you to welcome you all to this special edition of the SDG Media Zone with the Frankfurter Book Fair at the Arts Plus event, Creating a Revolution for Change. The SDG Media Zone aims to engage people in conversations on the issues at the heart of the Sustainable Development Goals and gives a stage to the people driving change, progress and debate on the most pressing issues of our time. The topics that we'll be talking about today will range from gender equality, SDG number five, to climate change, SDG number 13, education and literacy, SDG four, sustainable cities and communities, SDG 11, and I'm sure we'll touch on many others as well because they're very interconnected. We'll have short 15 to 20 minute sessions in both English and German. And so join us for a morning of discussion and food for thought. The speaker for our first segment, Equality for Girls in Malawi, Breaking the Cycle of Child Marriage, is truly an inspiration for young people. Memory Banda is an advocate, a feminist, and a fierce campaigner on education and against child marriage. She is the founder of Foundation for Girls Leadership, a nonprofit dedicating for, to raising young girl leaders and advocating for their rights. She is a powerful voice in advocating for the change of the legal marriage laws in Malawi. And through her work, she has succeeded in raising the legal marriage age from 15 to 18 in her country. She has spoken at TED, a very, very powerful and very popular TED Talk. She has spoken at the United Nations, at the 59th United Nations Commission on the Status of Women, and at the Oslo Freedom Forum. Everyone, please welcome Ms. Memory Banda. Have a seat. Sure, wherever you feel comfortable. So, Maybe we can start out by just talking a little bit about what child marriage is. And we know from the United Nations perspective that it's a human rights violation. Obviously, that's very important to establish from the, from the outset. But one in every five girls around the world is married before she's 18. And in developing countries, it's twice that. So we're not talking about a small issue. This is a major issue. And we're very grateful that you are taking this up as with your voice that you have around the world. And I'd like to hear if we can get started, because people want to hear you, um, how did you get started advocating for this particular topic? Thank you very much uh, for having me here today. Um, as you have already highlighted, uh, child marriage is a very big uh, problem uh, in my country and, of course, across Africa in uh, developing countries. And uh, for my... Um, Growing up in uh, one of the poorest uh, countries in the world, actually, for girls, that's even, even extreme, uh, where girls are not given uh, the opportunities to go on with education. Girls drop out of school. They face uh, a lot of gender-based violence, all sorts of uh, violence. And uh, growing up in that kind of uh, conditions actually affected me as well as a young girl. Um, so, uh, actually, to make it waste in such uh, developing countries, uh, the extreme tradition uh, practices actually are attached to culture, where now most traditions that affect girls are taken as a normal thing. And as girls, as we grow up in that kind of setup, we feel like, oh, this is the way how the world is supposed to be. This is the way how I am supposed to be without knowing that it's actually affecting me negatively. So, one of those traditions traditions is actually marrying off children at such a young age. And when girls reach a puberty stage, they are actually told to believe that they are supposed to go to the initiation camps. And uh, at the initiation camps, uh, it's actually where they learn a lot of things. For me, which actually part of some of them are okay, but the extreme part is actually to, to actually let them learn about uh, their sexuality in an extreme way uh, where actually they have to undergo the practical uh, training. And that's traumatizing for a nine-year-old girl, for a 10-year-old girl to go through that. So 
It's in that way that uh, the traditional leaders find it valuable that the girls have to go through this. Uh, so they go through a five-day, one-week training, and there they actually have to um, learn on how to sexually please a man. And on a special day, a man goes to the camp, rapes all the girls. And in some cases, the girls are actually told to find a man to crease them. So it's more of like graduating them from childhood into adulthood. And women have gone through that and they pass it on to their children. And the biggest question is why? It's because they have grown up knowing that's the right thing, you know? So when I saw my fellow young girls going through that, I had a lot of questions, but I knew one day I'll have to go through that because it's a mandatory thing. If you don't go, there are so many misconceptions surrounding that, that if you don't go, your parent is going to die, something bad will happen to you, so you actually have to go. So my sister happened that uh, she started her menstruation faster than me, and then she had to go. When she went, uh, I wasn't surprised she dropped out of school because that's the normal thing. When girls go, they usually drop out of school because of the extreme conditions that they've been in. So my little sister later on, she was found pregnant. The normal thing again, because girls after that, they usually drop out of school, they get pregnant because they're exposed into a sexual, extreme sexual education. So when I saw that, I felt, why can't... I break away. Why can't I be different? Why can't I say no that I, what will happen to me if I actually say no that I can't go to the initiation camp? So I tried my best. I told my mother that, that I'm not going to go to the initiation camp. It was a very uh, difficult thing for me to do and I was so young and uh, when I saw that happen to my younger sister because she was only 11 years old and I was 13. So I started my activism work at the age of uh, 13 because I thought that we needed a change. And we started speaking to the traditional leaders and they thought I was the rebel in the community and I was uh, a girl after all. Uh, girls, you're not supposed to stand out, out in front of traditional leaders, speak on issues that affect you. So I was a very different girl and my mother gave me support uh, because my mother, for me, I feel like she comes from the northern part of Malawi and she didn't go through that and I feel like she understood me why uh, I said no. And um, having support from my mother, it really gave me the strength to go on and speak about different issues. And I actually had to start the biggest campaign called Aumare When I Want, which actually took over the nation and it became the global talk. And uh, you, uh, so many organizations, both local, uh, international, they stepped in and we actually won as girls. So I feel like the voices of young people in my community, especially the voices of young girls, really gave it a powerful voice and uh, topping up with my powerful voice, it really made our readers realize how much some of the traditions need to be wiped out completely. And yeah. so you started advocating for this when you were 13 when years old. When I was old. 13 years old, yes. That's very impressive. Yes. Thank you. And today you are? I know I'm 23. And yes. you have achieved your dream of being able to be educated and to leave your, lead your life in the way that you want to. Absolutely. So more of like my story uh, really defines, of what, uh, defines what can happen if you actually invest in a girl child. If you put investment uh, in a girl's education, bigger things can happen. Bigger impacts in, in our communities uh, can happen. And I am that uh, revelation of what happens if you invest in a girl child. And how did you manage to have these ideas implemented in Malawi? Because it's one thing to be on the right side of a question and another thing to actually have those ideas implemented into policy and into law. How did you go about that? Well, um, as I said, um, 
I think uh, for, for things to translate into something bigger is never done in a silo. There is need for collo collaboration, there is need for partnerships. And for me, basically, uh, when I started speaking out, a lot of other young people in my country started speaking out, and that gave an amplified voice against all the challenges uh, that young people and girls specifically face uh, in my country. So with that big movement that we created in my, in, in my country. That's why we were able to lobby the parliamentarians to go on and tell them that the law has to change. Uh, if we have these traditions, and actually the law as well uh, doesn't have a backup for us girls, then we have nothing on the plate. So we actually had to go on and lobby the parliamentarians that the legal marriage age in the country has to change. And then in 2015, the legal marriage age was raised from 15 to 18, and all that took uh, collaboration and partnership, uh, partnerships at all levels, starting from the young people themselves and putting the girl child at the center of advocacy because she is the one who is affected uh, at larger part. Yeah. And has it taken off in other countries as well? You're working internationally now more. Absolutely. So my voice, uh, uh, my revolution as much as like, so later on with the work that I have been doing, I have become the first uh, of revolution against a child marriage and girl empowerment, not only in Malawi, not only in Africa, but across the world. And I have seen a lot uh, of things change and actually uh, a lot of other countries stepping up and going back, checking what the laws and the policies are. Are they uh, actually promoting women's rights? Are they supporting girls' uh, rights? And um, how are the women affected? So all that is being put in check. And at the same time, I feel like it's actually high time as uh, women across the world to actually step up and actually go back to our tables and uh, look at the culture, like define, lead define what culture is and uh, actually look at uh, culture if it actually, it is um, affecting the women uh, negatively uh, or positively. So anything that is affecting women negatively, as I said earlier, is something that has to be removed uh, completely. So there is, uh, it's high time that uh, things have to be defined and uh, demystified and actually disconstructed. So it's actually us women that have, we have to take those things uh, on check. No one is going to check uh, that thing for us. It's us women rechecking all that. Yeah. It sounds like it's a broader question now. Yeah. It's not just about child marriage, it's about women's education. It's Absolutely, about yeah. So what else are you working on? What are you preparing at the moment? Oh, okay, so uh, what I am working on, like, um, you know how like, the issue of um, putting policies in place um, and all those structures in place is the other, but looking at the implementation process is another big process that our countries, we have to uh, recheck as well, because uh, if we have the roles and policies in place, if they're not implemented, it's as well as not having them. So right now, um, as much as we have the law in Malawi that ban child marriages, but we know that child marriages are still going on. So right now, um, I'm working towards uh, um, putting in check the government and organizations uh, that actually the law itself, the, the policies, they have to be, to be implemented. And at the same time, I am working on building the movement uh, of girls, girl leaders uh, because uh, we have to create this generation so that uh, they are empowered. The girls, we have to make them know that a girl child can do anything. So I am creating that movement where girls are, should be able to rise up beyond the challenges that they're facing every day. Every day. And it sounds yeah. like you were influenced as well by and supported by your mother. So that idea of intergenerational support among women, I think, is probably a very important factor, not only in your success, but in, in the, the activities that you're leading. Can you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. So intergenerational conversations mm -hmm. uh, between us, different stages of women, uh, is actually very important because that's the one actually that keeps us in check so that we know that what uh, the past generation faced, 
this, the coming generation shouldn't face what we have faced. So that's more of like we are creating a better place for the next generation. And that can only happen if there are intergenerational uh, conversations, uh, intergeneration um, uh, checkups. So, yeah. And I have to ask you what your plans are. You're finishing your studies. What do you plan to do next? And we're, I think we're all very interested to know where your path will take you. Great. Uh, so in terms of my plans, I, uh, I'm growing my organization, Foundation for Girls Leadership, which is really a very huge thing for me and a very big thing for girls uh, back in my country. And uh, I'm also... Um, uh, planning to build the leadership academy, uh, more of like uh, I've really is something that has been in b at the back of my mind ever since I was a kid. Because when I look at the women representation uh, in politics, uh, in in economics, uh, in whatever arena, uh, we are really a disadvantage. Uh, so I want uh, to have the leadership academy where girls can be able to go and learn and explore their talents, uh, explore their leadership potential and rise beyond the bar. So I'm looking forward to uh, building that and of course continue my advocacy, my activism uh, in uh, girls and women uh, rights and uh, get uh, connected with different women across the world and uh, work towards uh, improving our world for it to be a better place. Yep. Do you think you'll write a book? Do you think you will write a book? Absolutely, <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. Yes, absolutely. I'll write a book. So I feel like... Um, uh, that's one thing that actually got really me inspired here. Uh, me being here, that has been the biggest, biggest inspiration uh, to meet different amazing lighters. And uh, people actually have a lot of questions about my personal story. You know how like every time I get to share at the tip of the iceberg, so there is much more to what I do than what I am able to share in a few minutes. So I feel like writing a book about uh, my life story, it will be something really amazing and I'm in the process. Yeah. And do you feel optimistic about the future of women's rights? Do you feel like we're making progress? Absolutely, absolutely. We are making a big progress. Uh, when I lead what our, our ancestors did, our, 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 our big women did, and looking at where we are now, I feel like there is so much that we women uh, have done. And uh, I'm very um, glad that actually a lot of things have happened and a lot of um, w our women have been able to break the glass ceiling, which is really a, a beautiful thing. And, uh, and actually we are going forward and nothing is really stopping us. And there are a lot of women rising up and that movement is what is making us stronger every day. And that is what actually is making me feel like... Uh, um, a feminist movement that is being created. It's really big that actually is really disconstructing uh, the patriarchy culture uh, system itself and uh, we are moving towards gender equality. So yes, we are moving towards that and things are really happening. We just need to push beyond the bar. And I think youth activism, which you're such a fantastic representative of, is key to that. And we see Greta Thunberg on climate change, you on child marriage. It's very inspiring, I think, to all of us to see youth rising up and having their voices heard. So thank you for that. We're thank very you. grateful thank you to so you for, for what you're doing at the United Nations and I think all of us, all of us here. Is there anything else that you would like to, to add to share with us? Well, uh, for me, Lily, I have seen that we have a lot of young people here. I think for me, uh, my advice goes back to the young people uh, that uh, there is nothing that is impossible. Everything is possible. Um, only if we rise up. And there is a lot of challenges that actually uh, the world is facing today. And we are the ones that can actually uh, change uh, things, can change the situation. We have to be creative. We have to be innovative. We have to speak up against all the social injustices that is happening around us. Because only when we speak, that's when you get to be listened to. So if you sit down as a young person, if we sit down as, uh, as women, nothing is going to change. So, Lily, it's... It's, it's in us. So the boy is actually in our court. 
Uh, so we have to actually really change things around us. And that is how we're going to achieve this fantastic Absolutely. Program. So that's how we're going to achieve all these goals. Uh, it's actually, it takes all of us to uh, achieve the sustainable development goals. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Memory. Such Thank a joy to so have much. you with us. Thank you. Thank you. Australia. Thank you. Would you like to stay with us for a bit? Thank you. Do you want to come up? Okay. okay. We're actually starting a little bit early. This never happens. So the next session is on a very different topic. It's on museums facing extinction. And it will be moderated by my colleague, Mr. Arna Malfenter, who's the head of the German Liaison Office for the United Nations Regional Information Center for Western Europe. Mr. Malfenter worked as a reporter and editor for the BBC World Service in London, a correspondent for the ARD in Berlin and Bonn, a personal speaker of the editor-in-chief of Die Zeit, I might not be saying that correctly, and as an author for Spiegel Online in Hamburg. Since 2002, he's been working with the United Nations, and he's dedicated his time to the organization's missions and goals. Please let us give a warm welcome to Mr. Monfelter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sherry, and uh, good morning, everyone here at uh, Frankfurt. I would like to uh, welcome everyone to the session on museums facing extinction. How and uh, why that is, we will learn from our guest speaker, Diane Drube. Welcome. Thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to say thank you to Memory. Um, it, was very oh, <laughs> it was a very passionate um, speech and, and what, what you have done, I, I don't know where she is now, uh, but what she has done the last 10 years is, is exceptional and really fundamental, so thank you. Um. <laughs> yeah, let, let's start with a brief introduction of uh, your work, Diane. Um, Diane Rubé is the founder of uh, We Are Museums, an organization dedicated to connecting and inspiring museum organizers and related communities on an international scale. Considered a museum futurist, uh, she has worked on transforming museums internationally for over a decade. She founded the Museum Think Tank in Berlin. She co-founded uh, Museo Mix, a three-day event marathon designed to bring together museums, companies, startups, and the general public and open innovative strategizing. She's currently the uh, curator of Museum Connections and previously worked at the French Ministry of Culture and Communication and the Ener Museum in Paris. So thank you for being with us today and uh, taking us into the world of museums which aim at changing the world. My first question is, where did the idea come from to found We Are Museums? Well, um, I actually think yeah, that you already gave the reply in the introduction because you were talking about openness, you were talking about to, uh, togetherness, you were talking about thinking, um, and, this, and you were talking about future. <laughs> so this intro is actually the reason why I founded We Are Museums. It's really to be able to uh, bring together like-minded museum professionals who wanted to put museums at the center of our society and really trying to um, see museums um, as very uh, essential agents that could actually transform people and our society. So not just focusing on the object and the collection and the past, but really our museums could be tools to um, foster social, um, social innovation and social change, basically. 
Could you uh, explain to us how do you create communities around museums? How is it done from your point of view? Um, well, it's, it's very, very simple. I will say we are all humans and we all have um, different interests. And when we have the same interest, we gather. <laughs> so um, why are we here this morning? It's because we are interested by the future of culture. Um, and so what I started to do is gathering the people uh, interested by the future of museums. I actually wanted to give another place for museums in our society, like I said. And muse museum professionals willing to share what they are doing, their experiences, but as well um, their failures. Um, so it's having this benevolence and this openness and, you know, all the museum professionals just wanted to work together, not seeing each other as competitors, but really thinking that they can help each other because we are all going in the same direction. Um, but most of the time in the society, we still see things very divided while we should all think together. <laughs> um, so basically trying to open up museums by... Um, um, yeah, fostering collaboration, um, sharing ideas, best practices, and and really, as well, I said that before, but gathering physically in one place. It's not just online, talking through social media or through emails, but really having this human interaction, thinking and feeling that we are all actually the same and we all want the same thing, if I reply to your question. <laughs> Given your vast experience in this field, can you tell us a little bit more about the mission? How can we actually focus on the SDGs and how can we turn museums and local communities into climate leaders in promoting climate protection? Well, that's a huge question. Um, but I actually believe museums already worked towards uh, the different SDGs and it's something that um, yeah, that we have seen the last 10 years, museums actually really working with their local communities, wor working with their neighbors, trying to create spaces for people to express themselves, themself, to have a voice. Um, their museums are fostering more and more um, the non-neutrality and they want to actually raise awareness on the right topics as well. So it's not just about showing what the past was about, but really trying to bring this platform for reflection and understanding where we all go and where all we all go together. Um, so yeah, that's a broad, <laughs> broad reply. Talking about climate, um, we actually decided to give the big focus on the 13 SDG because we said that this was actually the um, biggest emergency that we were facing. Um, of course, museums have the power to really act on many of them, maybe not all of them, um, depending on what kind of museum it is. For instance, the Natural History Museum could definitely act on the, um, on the 12 um, as well. But it's... Um, uh, okay, I just, I just lost, <laughs> lost my throat. <laughs> but basically saying that, um, yeah, we decided to, to focus on the 13, 13, 2 and 13, 3. Uh, raising awareness, um, changing the museum by themselves, like as a building, as museum employee, how they could actually act and become more um, green agent. Um, there is different levels, actually, but I think we will talk about it afterwards. Yeah, maybe right? we can... Uh, also get more concrete, what is the most striking example of the recent past you've seen? Um, well, there is many of them. I really like um, the example of Thread. Thread is actually an um, art center in Senegal, and it's all the building. It's actually a, a, a mix between a Japanese culture and um, European culture, mixed, um, trying to mix all this culture and, and Giving the, giving the best, so the building itself and the program of the art center could be the, be the most sustainable as possible. So just by, for instance, the, um, the architecture itself is totally vernacular, so it's just using the um, uh, component and the um, element from, from the ground, from the place around the museum. They collect rain, rain water, so in Senegal it's very precious. They actually uh, give spaces around the museum so uh, people from the villages nearby could actually um, grow some food. Um, they give space 
for students to actually work after school to charge their phone. Um, and at the same time, they are actually meeting different artist residencies that are coming from different places. So it's this kind of international platform in the center of the countryside in Senegal. And this example, and I'm just giving you like, yeah, the top, the top of the iceberg, but um, this example is, to my mind, one of the best. Um, it's really opening up the museum and, and fully um, embodying the, the, the potential of how museum could actually change and help local communities and people, basically. Thanks, that's a very interesting <laughs> example. Uh, my next question would be how can we actually turn our museums worldwide into carbon-free spaces? Um, well, there is many, many ways. Um, that's a big topic as well. And, and I will maybe start by explaining why it is so difficult for museums to actually do it. Um, and museums that are now starting to build new architecture and new building are really facing big issues and big questions. Basically, um, when you need to take care of a collection, you need to actually regulate the temperature and regulate the air um, condition. And this, um, this is mostly, most of the time, going against um, sustainability and against um, uh, carbon footprint. So museums have to be very, very clever, and they have to actually think about sustainability and transforming the building green as a strategic goal, a strategic pr priority. And if you think that this is actually something that should be done anyway, um, you start to think about the, the other things um, on the second level. So just giving the priority to turn the building green, I think it's the first step. Then a lot of things um, are being done, just like putting some solar panels um, on top of the roof. Um, for instance, the Futurium in Berlin, they actually decided to not have this fancy rooftop with this fancy cafe and restaurant um, on, uh, on their rooftop, but they decided to actually cover the roof with solar panel. And now they are producing so much energy that even uh, providing energy to the neighbors. So you see like in the center of Berlin, next to Tiergarten, you actually see this museum giving, providing uh, solar energy to the other buildings nearby. So that's one example. Um, I can give you so many others, <laughs> really. Okay, thank you. Um, let's turn to, to another uh, issue. Uh, we've all heard of the Fridays for Future activities. From your point of view, how can we use our museums or can we at all uh, use museums as a civic platform for climate activism? Well, beautiful examples as well. A um, few months ago, Tate gave the turbine all to the um, Extension Rebellion movement so they could actually gather and, and have this huge um, media uh, coverage as well. Um, and having the support of a museum like Tate for a movement like Extension Rebellion is a huge step. And that's also why this, that's a, such a powerful movement in the UK right now, because they have the support of these big institutions. Um, if we go back to Germany, the uh, Naturkunde Museum in Berlin, they actually open their space every Friday to Friday for Culture, uh, Friday for Future. <laughs> Um, they actually uh, organize <laughs> workshops. Um, they have some um, talks and panel discussions with experts about extinctions, um, the different species um, facing extinction as well. So you can give the space, you can um, collect the signs from the, from the different pro protests, you can um, raise awareness with different exhibitions or with different workshops. Um, it's something that we start to see more and more. Museums are really opening up to different um, movements and to different um, actions, uh, really civic actions like that. They use really their voices, and that's something that is beautiful. You know, 10 years ago, museums were still very neutral and very cautious about what they were saying, what they could say or not. Um, now museums, they have their own personality, and they dare actually saying that they disagree with something. 
in November, um, this year at the end of, of the, the month, um, in the UK, they will organize this big protest against um, oil sponsor, um, companies related to oil sponsoring museums. And this will be a huge wave of rebellion <laughs> from the museum scene against um, oil sponsorship. And this is, again, just one example. <laughs> Apart from, from these activities you've mentioned, uh, as a leading expert in this field, uh, what kind of partnerships are crucial for the survival of museums? Um, well, I think something that is very important and, and is really well said in the SDG is that to act globally, you need to think about small actions, local small actions. And I will say that you need to tackle the different levels of partnerships. So um, here, actually, um, we are showing this picture that is an um, illustration of our project called Museums Facing Extinction in, in um, partnership with EIT Climate Kick. So having this support from this um, private public European um, organization is very valuable for us because we can reach another level of policy um, as well, we actually start to act in a very local way. So we will have one event, one workshop actually at the Future Yam in Berlin, another one in Manchester, another one in Georgia, hopefully uh, different ones all along the year next year in different places. So having very um, local partnerships, um, but as well, not just with museums, but um, also with the neighbors. So just trying to understand who is living next to your museum and trying to see how the museum could actually work with the neighbor to organize something, to create a workshop, to have a zero waste, um, a zero waste um, training uh, session. And of course, talking about the micro communities, um, understanding how these very small group um, of the society could actually act together with the museum in different different topics and different levels. So, yeah, I would say having these big um, umbrellas um, institutions and these very local ones is the best way to get yeah, to have good partnerships. And apart from visiting museums ourselves, what can every one of us do to support museums in these endeavors you mentioned? Um, well, so a big issue for museums is um, when you start to look at the museum industry itself is actually the temporary exhibitions. So constantly museums are providing new exhibitions using a lot of big um, um, material, a lot of equipment and each time this is actually going back to um, waste and this is a huge issue so I will say if local communities and museums could actually create a resourcery like a share shop a place where um, stu uh, art students um, associations and museum could actually share and, and use all together different resources to create exhibitions, but to create workshops, to create trainings. If this place could actually be a collective place, I think we could definitely stop wasting so much equipment and so much material. Like things should not be used one time. Um, and it's by really fostering this kind of collaboration, trans, um, trans uh, disciplinary and trans organization collaboration that we can finally stop wasting so much. So that's, that could be one example. Um, then um, definitely um, trying to, when I've seen something really good at Tate, um, at the Olaf Uryasan exhibition, they are just, they are giving this small uh, leaflet, and then they are actually uh, asking the visitors to give back the leaflet so it could be recycled. So this is one example. Try to think about everything that you consume, even if it's, it's a gift or it's given to you, as something that can be recycled or reused, or give it back to someone afterwards. Um, I think it's, it's really a mindset that should be adapted. Thank you. Um, let's turn back to uh, We Are Museums. Where do you see We Are Museums in the future? That's, that's a big question and it's, it's a bit 
it's really related to how I see the future itself. Um, I actually really think that museums should really take the road of um, climate action and 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 it's really something that I will try to support more and more, um, trying to really accelerate how museums could transform themselves and become active agent for a climate resilient future. Um, I don't know yet how we are museums will actually be in the next few years. And I actually see this movement as something very fluid, a little bit like water. You know, it could actually go in the soil, it could go um, in, in a glass, or it could go um, in a river, but water is still water. It's actually, the consistency is still the same, and it, it's going in one direction. So I don't know the shape of it yet, but I know it will go in the right direction. And related to this, my last question, will you hold events also outside of Europe? Well, we already did one event in Morocco two years ago in Marrakech. Uh, we were actually talking about the neighborhood. Our museum could start to work with their um, with their neighbors and start to collect intangible uh, heritage. How do you actually collect the identity of the Medina, for instance? So um, this is something that we have done. Uh, we will organize something in Georgia, in Tbilisi as well, uh, and hopefully more and more. But this will be, yeah. We'll, this will be announced a bit later. All right. Diane, thank you very much for your wonderful insights into these uh, important topics. And uh, thank you for your interest. Have a good day here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arna. Thank you, Ms. Dubray. Very interesting topic. We're moving on to another SDG, another topic that is very important to all of us, climate change. So I would like to introduce Ms. Mechthild Harting, who will be moderating the next sex sex segment in German. It's called The State of the Planet, with guest speakers Alexander Repening and Dr. Ina Klobuk. Mechthild Harting is a journalist for the German newspaper Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. Before that, she worked in the press office of the federal taxpayers in Dusseldorf local newspaper, Die Burger and Zeiger, and Radio FFH. Ms. Harting specializes in regional affairs and state policy, and she's written on a myriad of topics ranging from finance and urban development to climate action, but I think she's been working on climate action for quite a long time, and we're very grateful to your work, and we welcome to the SDG Media Zone. Schönen guten Tag, meine Damen und Herren. Ich darf Ihnen nochmal meine Podiumsrunde vorstellen. Wir haben ja schon viel über das Thema Zukunft gehört, was dafür zu tun ist. Und seit einem Jahr gibt es ja, seit gut einem Jahr ein Thema, wir haben es eben auch schon gehört, das uns alle beschäftigt. Ich würde sagen, nach einem heißen Sommer und einer Bewegung, die die ganze Welt in Atem hält, reden wir eigentlich ganz vorneweg über alle über das Thema Klimawandel. Ich darf Ihnen noch mal vorstellen, zu meiner Rechten sitzt Frau Ina Knobloch, sie ist promovierte Biologin, Umweltschützerin seit ewig und drei Tagen, also hat das Thema nicht jetzt erst neu auf den Schirm bekommen und sie hat ein Buch veröffentlicht zusammen mit Hannes Jennecke, dem Schauspieler und bekannten Umweltaktivisten, Sie haben es hier vorne stehen, Aufschrei der Meere. 
Auf der anderen Seite sitzt von mir sitzt Alexander Reppening. Er ist Polit Politökonom, Entschuldigung, ich stolper noch, Politökonom und arbeitet für den Alternativ Nobelpreis Stiftung in Genf derzeit. Aber vor allen Dingen sind Sie jetzt hier, weil Sie gemeinsam mit dem deutschen Gesicht von der Bewegung Fridays for Future, Luisa Neubauer, dieses Buch verfasst haben vom Ende der Klimakrise, was also brandaktuell hier präsentiert ist, seit Mittwoch, glaube ich, auf dem Markt. Herzlichen Dank beiden, dass Sie da sind. Sie schreiben in Ihren beiden, bei in beiden Büchern darüber sehr eindrücklich, wie die Situation im Moment ist wie insbesondere auch das Leben in den Meeren aus dem Lot geraten ist. Und Sie beide machen deutlich, dass sich grundsätzlich etwas ändern muss. Wir wollen jetzt in der nächsten halben Stunde ein bisschen mehr über dieses Grundsätzliche, was sich ändern muss, reden, als dass wir über den Status reden, gibt es diese Klimakrise oder nicht, sondern wir wollen über das Grundsätzliche reden. Frau Knoblauch, lassen Sie uns über dieses Grundsätzliche reden. Sie haben dieses Buch verfasst. Und was hat sich für Sie persönlich dadurch verändert? Haben Sie noch mal ganz andere Dinge, die Sie heute im Kopf haben und die Sie anders machen? Sie ganz persönlich, hat das Ihren Alltag verändert, dieses Buch? Also das Arbeiten am Buch auf jeden Fall. Ich habe es auch besser in meinem Umfeld hinein, in mein Umfeld hineintragen können. Aber natürlich beschäftige ich mich seit Jahrzehnten mit dem Thema. Ich schreibe darüber, habe Dutzende Filme gemacht und es war lange Zeit so, dass ich, dass keine, ja, kein Sender mehr irgendetwas zu dem Thema haben wollte. Es hieß Anfang der 90er Jahre nichts Alarmistisches mehr. Das Thema ist durch. Ähm, uns wurden die Sendeplätze gestrichen und das war alle, waren vor allen Dingen Beispielthemen, die wir dann äh, machen durften, konnten. Ich habe mich mit anderen Themen dann beschäftigt. Ich habe letztes Jahr ja den Filmpreis für, für meinen Film gegen Antisemitismus bekommen. Auch ganz, ganz wichtige Themen. Und, äh, aber ich habe gespürt im letzten Jahr, jetzt kann es wieder ankommen. Und dann hat auch der Verlag gleich, ich habe vorher eben auch ein seichteres Thema, ähm, Baumhaus mit Faultier, da habe ich auch eine Sendereihe zu gemacht. Ähm, da geht es natürlich auch um Waldschutz und um Klima. Ich habe das da reingewurschtelt. Eigentlich äh, waren da noch die Bücher au Vank. Da ging es um Lebensschicksale und das Persönliche, also das Me, Myself and I. Die Leute wollten eigentlich mehr wissen ähm, über mich persönlich, von innen nach außen, was passiert mit mir, wenn ich im Dschungel bin. So was will ich nicht schreiben, finde ich auch. Das geht niemandem etwas an. Ich ich habe etwas geschrieben, was ist passiert in den letzten 30 Jahren mit den Wäldern und die Zusammenhänge von den Wäldern. Ich habe nämlich damals Bäume gepflanzt äh, und habe aus diesem Holz das Baumhaus gebaut. Als, äh, als Kunstobjekt, äh, das ist mein persönlicher CO2-Speicher. Also ich bin so lange mit dem Thema drin, dass sich dann im Persönlichen ständig etwas ändert. Natürlich muss ich dahin fliegen, aber wenn ich Leuchtturmprojekte mache, irgendeinen Kopf muss ich schlucken und mit jedem Atemzug atme ich CO2 aus. Was ich tatsächlich mehr gemacht habe, also ich wäre schon längst Vegetarierin, muss ich ganz ehrlich sein, wenn mein, mein Mann und meine Kinder nicht eigentlich das so gerne essen würden. Ich habe es runtergedrückt, dass wir ganz wenig Fleisch essen, aber mit dem Fisch habe ich es jetzt noch mehr geschafft. Ich habe wirklich en Detail erzählt, wie mit Quecksilber gespickt die Fische sind und dass das eigentlich ein Endlager ist für Schwermetalle, sodass ich da mit diesen Themen auch besser durchgekommen bin und es hat mich auch noch mal ganz anders berührt, muss ich sagen, wenn ich die Bilder gesehen habe und alles, also es wühlt einen schon dann noch mal anders auf. Das große Thema bei den Meeren ist natürlich immer die Verschmutzung, auch mit Plastikmüll. Da ganz konkret, hat sich was für Sie verändert? Gehen Sie heute anders mit Verpackungen um, mit Plastik, mit Kunststoff um? Oder sagen Sie, das, das, das haben wir, das, da hat sich gar nicht viel getan, das wusste ich schon. Ja, natürlich wusste ich das. Ich muss ganz ehrlich sagen, ich habe mir die gelbe Tonne nicht hingestellt, weil ich wusste, dass das Plastik nach Afrika und nach Asien geschippert wird, schon ganz früh. Ich habe dazu Filme gemacht, dass auch die verschiedenen Plastiksorten keinesfalls recycelt werden können. Das, das schlimmste Plastik ist das fluorierte, halogenierte Plastik, also PVC und diese Geschichten. Die sind ja hochtoxisch, während PET dann nur aus Kohlendioxid quasi als CO2 erlastig ist. Aber das ist ein ganz großes Klimathema. Das heißt, vermeiden, vermeiden, vermeiden. Und es ist jetzt einfacher, weil es jetzt mehr Läden gibt, wo man tatsächlich ohne Plastik auch was kaufen kann. Also im Supermarkt äh, meckert mich keiner mehr an, wenn ich die Äpfel einzeln äh, dann da hinlege auf die Waage. Und ähm, ich komme einfach besser durch. Ich bin auch beim, mit dem Verlag, der hat sofort gesagt, wir machen das Buch ohne Plastikhülle. Also ich komme einfach jetzt, es ist so unglaublich befreiend, weil ich jetzt mit den Themen durchkomme. Herr Reppenich, diese Aussage, das wusste ich ja schon vorher, aber im Grunde hat es gar nicht viele Leute interessiert. Das ist ja mit einer Grundthese Ihres Buchs, dass Sie sagen, man weiß es alles und man hat es aber nie umgesetzt, man hat es sich ernst genommen. Viele Leute sagen einfach, so Ihre These jedenfalls, 
eigentlich, ich wüsste, was ich tun müsste, aber es passt mir nicht in Kram. Ist das Ihre, mit eine These Ihres Buchs? Habe ich das richtig verstanden? Naja, das ist, das ist äh, ein bisschen die Beobachtung, dass die, ähm, die wissenschaftlichen Fakten, die wir dazu haben, zu dem Thema Klimakrise oder Klimawandel, ähm, seit mindestens 30 Jahren einfach bekannt sind. Ähm, und genau diese Frage, also beim Hitzesommer musste ich daran denken, 1988 gab es in den USA einen ganz großen Hitzesommer und das war eines der Jahre, wo in den USA äh, ganz stark über die Klimakrise diskutiert wurde und wo es sozusagen auch äh, davor stand, irgendwie auf internationaler Ebene mit Abkommen und etwas dagegen zu tun. Das ist über 30 Jahre her und genau diese Frage von was ist in diesen 30 Jahren passiert. Wir wussten, also wir haben wissentlich sozusagen als Gesellschaft ähm, nichts oder nicht genug dagegen unternommen und sind jetzt in dieser, in dieser Krisensituation. Insofern würde er sagen, ja, das Nichthandeln obwohl es äh, bekannt ist, was die Folgen dessen sind, äh, ist ein, ein riesiges gesellschaftliches Problem und zwar seit Jahrzehnten in diesem, in diesem Thema. Also da würde ich mal kurz noch mal einhaken. Ja, bitte, Sie müssen das Mikrofon ja. nehmen. Äh, da möchte ich mal kurz einhaken. Ähm, ich gehe noch weiter zurück eben in die 80er Jahre. Da ist viel passiert. Wir haben unglaubliche Verbote durchbekommen. Wir haben FCKW-Verbote. Also wie die Welt wäre wär heute eine andere, wenn wir nicht wahnsinnig gehandelt hätten. Was war ein Gejammer von der Industrie, als es hieß, Blei wird verboten im Benz. Oh, da fahren die Autos nicht. Mein BMW und Gott, da geht der Motor kaputt. Es war ein Geschrei und Gejammer. Die Waschindustrie, Phosphat, dann wäscht die Wäsche nicht mehr. Also wir haben unglaublich viele Verbote durchbekommen und eben auch sehr, sehr viel für Umwelt und Klima getan. Das wäre schon alles kollabiert. Also die äh, Flüsse sind gekippt, äh, die Seen, der Bodensee war ein, ein grünes Algenmeer und äh, war so eutrophiert, dass es komplett gekippt ist, dass es mehr CO2 ausgestoßen hat, als, es, äh, all, als ein, ein natürlicher äh, äh, Biokomposter, möchte ich mal sagen. Und dabei äh, kompensieren die Gewässer ja CO2 normalerweise, wenn sie intakt sind. Ähm, und dann in den 90ern war es anders, dann hat die Industrie gesagt, auch gerade nach dem Hitzesommer und die Politik hat gesagt, okay, okay, wir müssen etwas tun und haben die Deutungshoheit übernommen und es wurde ihnen geglaubt. Dann wurde nämlich eingeführt, das duale System wurde eingeführt, es wurde Rio, also Klimakonferenzen wurden eingeführt, jede Menge Labels, FSC-Label, Regenwald und die Leute haben es geglaubt, dass sich jetzt die Welt bessert und sie sich persönlich nicht mehr so kümmern müssen und haben die Deutungshoheit abgegeben. Sie haben den Labels geglaubt, sie haben der Politik geglaubt und es war eine gigantische greenwashing machine Also ich habe es nicht geglaubt, aber es, man muss auch wirklich die Details kennen und es ist eine unver, unglaublich unverschämte Volksverarsche gewesen, äh, in einem sehr alarmierten Zeitgeist eigentlich und man hat gesagt, jetzt wird es gut, wir packen es an. So, jetzt Zu dem Ozonloch ja, würde ich gerne, ich FCKW ja, ja. würde ich gerne, es ist tatsächlich ein äh, sehr gutes Beispiel, weil es auch die, die Frage der äh, Ozonschicht äh, und de, der schädlichen FCKW-Gase wurde oder Fluorenkorid-Wasserstoffe äh, wurde eben äh, sehr stark Hand in Hand mit der globalen Erwärmung damals diskutiert und äh, mittlerweile erholt sich die Ozonschicht durch das Montreal-Protokoll in 87 und das ist sozusagen ein Beispiel dafür, wie wissenschaftliche Erkenntnisse innerhalb von 13 Jahren dazu geführt haben, dass internationale Verbote und Regulierungen dazu geführt haben, dass wir jetzt auf dem Weg der Besserung sind. Und bei der Klimakrise wurde eben, obwohl es im Bundestag diskutiert wurde, gerade habe ich noch mal von der Enquete-Kommission die 88 300-seitigen Zwischenbericht äh, vorgelegt hat zum Schutz der Erstatmosphäre und genau diese Themen wurden da verhandelt. Und äh, das war äh, zu der Frage, was ich dabei auch bei dem Buch gelernt habe, immer wieder wie Schuppen von den Augen gefallen, so Bevor ich auf der Welt war, wurden diese Themen schon ähnlich, wie sie heute diskutiert wurden, ähm, diskutiert und angegangen. Und ja, durch, diese, ähm, durch den politischen Stillstand oder die, die Übernahme der... Durch die Lügen, durch die Lügen, dass es damit angegangen okay. wird. Halt, jetzt <lacht> nochmal äh, die Lügen. Aber die Frage ist ja, wie kommen wir jetzt sozusagen, wie kann man das auffangen, dass so wenig passiert ist in den letzten Jahren? Ist es... Ist, wir können sicherlich an die äh, Politik appellieren, da werden wir auch noch gleich drüber reden, aber ist es erstmal, braucht der Einzelne die Einsicht, dass er, dass sich, dass er was tun muss oder reicht es eben zu sagen, da gibt es eine Regierung, da gibt es andere, die haben sich zu kümmern, äh, die, die können das regeln über Verbote. Wie wichtig ist es, dass der Einzelne sein Handeln anpasst? Ähm, also die Frage, die oder der Einsicht, also der Einsicht von Einzelnen ist in, insofern total wichtig, 
als dass ähm, wir uns wieder als politische Wesen begreifen müssen, die ähm, jetzt nicht nur im individuellen Konsum, das ist eine der ähm, Punkte, die wir da sehr stark auch ausführen, zu sagen, es reicht nicht jetzt sich ähm, im Konsum äh, bewusster irgendwie zu verhalten, sondern wir müssen uns als politische Wesen begreifen, die äh, Druck auf Regierungen vor allen Dingen, weil sie diese Macht haben, auch in, im größeren Maßstab Dinge zu verändern, ähm, auszuüben. Und das ist ja auch äh, das, was im Endeffekt die ähm, Fridays for Future Bewegung, was wir irgendwie seit Dezember letzten Jahres, Greta seit August letzten Jahres irgendwie auf die Straße trägt und zu sagen, wir ähm, es ist eine gesamtgesellschaftliche Aufgabe und das wieder bei den Individuen abzuladen, äh, ist, eine, ja, ist eine große Gefahr. Und das heißt nicht, dass diese Dinge nicht wichtig sind, aber ich sehe eben eine Gefahr darin, dann zu sagen, ähm, es ist sozusagen Sache der, des Einzelnen auf ähm, ja, Plastik zu verzichten oder bestimmte Dinge, wo ich sage, das reicht nicht, das mhm. reicht bei Weitem nicht. Aber wie wir gehört haben, reicht es eben auch nicht zu sagen, es machen andere. Also man muss schon selber, wie Sie sagen, politisches Wesen werden und auch ein Auge drauf haben, dass da was passiert. Ja, auf jeden Fall. Also ich, ähm, ja. äh, also die, das beste Beispiel haben wir am 20. September erlebt. Mit dem, es waren 1,4 Millionen Menschen auf der Straße in Deutschland. Und äh, dieses Klimapaketchen, gestern auf einem der Podien wurde es als Klimapostkarte bezeichnet, das äh, passt vielleicht irgendwie noch besser, ähm, ist sozusagen bei Weitem nicht das, was wir brauchen, um in die Nähe von diesen äh, Paris-Zielen, die äh, im Bundestag auch ähm, beschlossen wurden, ähm, in die Nähe zu kommen. Also insofern, ja, es braucht weiterhin äh, diesen Druck total und äh, offenbar ist die Regierung nicht willens oder in der Lage, ähm, die entsprechenden Maßnahmen zu ergreifen. Und so lange äh, müssen wir diesen Druck auch erhöhen. Eva, noch also weiter reden über Druck erhöhen. Äh, ich nenne nur mal ein Beispiel. Nächste Woche wird hier praktisch vor der äh, Messe Frankfurt der Marathon stattfinden. Der, einer der ältesten oder der älteste Marathon, Städtemarathon, den es äh, gibt oder in Deutschland gibt. Und die machen schon seit geraumer Zeit, aber dieses Jahr wird nochmal ganz groß gesagt, das wird ein nachhaltiger Marathon, es wird Freifahrten für alle Teilnehmer und Helfer geben, es wird statt Plastikbecher, ich weiß nicht, ob Sie jemals diese Lawine von Müll gesehen haben, nachdem eine Läuferkolonne durchgelaufen ist, es wird dieses Jahr Papier statt Plastikbecher geben und für jeden Läufer, der durchs Ziel geht, wird ein Euro gespendet, um Olivenbäume in der Toskana zu pflanzen. Ist das richtig so oder ist sowas Greenwashing? Also ich will ich, Sie noch mal mehr nageln, sozusagen, wo ja, ist die Gesellschaft bin, in der Verantwortung und wo sind irgendwie also ich glaube, Politik dass in der Verantwortung? Ganz entscheidend ist, dass sozusagen in den, äh, in den jeweiligen gesellschaftlichen Bereichen, wo die Menschen tätig sind und eben nicht, nicht nur als Konsumentin, wir werden irgendwie jahrzehntelang immer nur als Konsumentin angesprochen, sondern eben als Teil von den beruflichen Kontexten, dass wir da eben schauen, wie sich auch, ähm, ja, Verhaltensweisen, Strukturen verändern lassen. Ich, ich kenne mich mit dem Marathon nicht genug aus, um den Detail beur, beurteilen zu können. Nein, nur wenn Sie es hören, das aber wenn ja ich ganz höre, so. würde ich sagen, ja, es ist sozusagen ein Schritt in die richtige Richtung, aber wir sollten uns auf gar keinen Fall da, darauf ausruhen, dass das irgendwie reicht. Und ähm, es wird trotzdem noch wahnsinnig viel Müll da, dabei produziert und ähm, wir, wir sind in einer Situation, wo die, die Transformation, die wir brauchen gesellschaftlich durch die Abhängigkeit von fossilen Energien und durch die und sozusagen nicht nachhaltige Wirtschaftsweise und Lebensweise, äh, wir, also die so umfassend ist, ähm, dass, dass es auf jeden Fall breite politische ähm, Handlungen sozusagen auf Regierungsebene geben muss und ähm, es gibt auch sozusagen im Privatsektor und in vielen Bereichen ähm, Beispiele, wo sozusagen, ja, wo es die Pionierinitiativen braucht, aber eben in einem noch nie dagewesenen Umfang. Also wir brauchen beides zusammen eigentlich, ein Zusammenspiel. Ja, ich, ich, also die Hauptnachricht wäre, wir sind alle gefordert. Wir können uns nicht, also mhm. und wir sind alle gefordert im Sinne von äh, uns äh, zu organisieren, zusammenzuschließen und sichtbar zu machen, wie es äh, anders gehen kann. Und dass es eben nicht reicht, ähm, es auf individueller Ebene zu tun und dass es eben nicht reicht, zu warten, bis auf politischer Ebene etwas passiert. Frau Knobloch, brauchen wir Verbote? 
ich habe ein Interview mit dem Herrn Jennecke gehört und der sagt, Verbote würden die Sache sehr erleichtern, wenn es sozusagen von staatlicher Seite aus gesagt wird, macht das nicht mehr und wir warten nicht auf die Einsicht des Konsumenten. Ist das auch Ihre Auffassung? Äh, das war ursprünglich mein. Ich habe lange mit Hannes darüber diskutiert. Er hat nämlich gesagt, Verbote geht nicht. Aber ich habe doch, wir brauchen Verbote. Macht das Leben leichter. Sie ne? geben ja in Ihrem Buch 99 Rat äh, Tipps, was man Meine machen 99 soll. Thesen. Aber davon sind, jetzt muss ich genau gucken, 53, 52, was ich persönlich ändern muss und nur 40 sozusagen, äh, was von politischer Seite aus passieren muss. Aber sagen Sie zu den Verboten, warum, warum helfen uns Verbote? Naja, das ist, wenn ich nicht vor die Wahl gestellt werde und das einfacher ist, also zum Beispiel beim, bei, den, bei den ganz einfachen Dingen, bleiben Sie beim Haarspray, bei den ganzen Spray-Geschichten ohne FCKW, ähm, macht es nicht das Ozonloch kaputt, wenn ich die Auswahl hätte, nehme ich ein FCKW freies oder eins äh, mit FCKW, wie es eine Zeit lang war, aber es auf Freiwilligkeit basierte, dass die Hersteller das machen konnten oder auch nicht. Ähm, ja, dann macht der Verbraucher, manche denken gar nicht drüber nach, manche nehmen das Billigere und manche bilden sich ein, das hat dann, es, es funktioniert besser. Also das ist ganz, ganz wichtig, dieser Schritt. Und jetzt kräht kein Hahn mehr danach, nach dem FCKW äh, in, in, äh, in, in so einer eine Spraydose. Mikroplastik in Kosmetik ist völlig überflüssig. Es braucht kein Mensch, das macht einfach, äh, es blustert auf, ähm, äh, es macht ein größeres Volumen. Das ist einfach ein, eine Win-Win-Situation für die Industrie. Also es gibt einen ganzen Katalog von Ver Verboten, der den Menschen unheimlich helfen würde. Glyphosat, ja, das ist ein Teufelszeug. Und die haben natürlich ein wahnsinniges Marketingbudget, um äh, den Leuten weiß zu machen, dass Glyphosat uns irgendwie ähm, hilft. Es gibt jede Menge Biobauern, die ohne Glyphosat auskommen, die auch im großen Stil ähm, anbauen, Landwirtschaft betreiben. Also, und das ist so toxisch, tödlich für die Flüsse für die, äh, und damit für die Sauerstoffpumpe Ozean. Wenn der Ozean kippt, brauchen wir überhaupt nicht anfangen mit, Klima, äh, mit Klimasteuern, mit CO2-Steuer. Dann ist alles zu spät. Dann, dann ist äh, wirklich mit der Menschheit vorbei. Und das muss man sich bewusst sein. Das ist die größte Kohlenstoffsenke, die wir haben. Und ähm, zum gesellschaftlichen Auftrag gehe ich noch ein Stück weiter. Ähm, wir müssen zwar unser Verhalten ändern, aber es ist so weit, dass wir auch wieder ähm, nicht nur auf die Straße gehen müssen, um allgemein fürs Klima, sondern direkt auch bestimmte Sachen boykottieren. Mit einem Boykottaufruf für bestimmte Produkte kann ich viel erreichen. Da erreiche ich, dass die Politik merkt, okay, wenn die Verbote eingeführt werden, mh, dann setzen die ähm, äh, Wähler doch das Kreuzchen vielleicht bei mir und sind gar nicht sauer auf mich, die wollen es ja. Und die Industrie ist auch plötzlich gefordert, weil denen geht das ja nur um, um den Umsatz. Also da kann ganz, ganz viel im Einzelnen passieren, bis wirklich die Ziele erreicht sind, die wir in einer Gesellschaft brauchen. Und Anfang der 90er hat man gedacht, man hat diese Ziele erreicht. Ne? Also da war dieser Wille da, aber natürlich hat die Industrie nur ähm, wirtschaftswachstumsmäßig gedacht und das funktioniert nicht weiter. Wir müssen, wir dürfen unser Hirn nicht abgeben, unser, alles durchdenken. Okay, äh, Reppin, ich, wir haben schon gehört, die Industrie wird hier gesagt, hat sozusagen eindeutig ihre äh, Prämissen. Würden Sie, welche Aufgabe sehen Sie für die Wirtschaft mitzumachen bei diesem Thema? Wie finde ich, Ihr Buch heißt ja so schön vom Ende der Klimakrise, also wie kommen wir zum Ende der Klimakrise wirklich? Wie verhindern wir eigentlich, ja, dass sie weitergeht, die Klimakrise? Welche Rolle hat die Wirtschaft Ihrer Ansicht nach? Unternehmen? Ja, also ähm, ein Beispiel, was wir aufführen, ist ähm, der, der Bosch-Konzern hat ähm, bei, bei, äh, das Ziel ausgesprochen, zum nächsten Jahr klimaneutral zu werden und sie werden dafür zwei Milliarden Euro investieren. Eine Milliarde davon werden sie über die nächsten Jahre sozusagen wieder einsparen, weil sie sozusagen ähm, ja, die sozusagen, ähm, Dämmung und äh, energieeffizienter und so weiter auch ähm, produzieren. Aber es ist sozusagen ein, ein sehr umfangreiches ähm, ähm, Investition, ähm, die ein, als sozusagen ein Vorbild in der, in der Branche gesehen werden kann. Ähm, aber aus unserer Sicht geht es genau darum, also das Thema Verbote, da sprechen wir auch viel darüber, dass, ähm, wir, also dass es Rahmenbedingungen geben muss, die tatsächlich Handlungsleiten sind und äh, sozusagen sowohl auf individueller Ebene sollten wir nicht vor die Wahl gestellt werden zwischen nicht nachhaltigen Produkten. Ich sollte mich nicht dafür entscheiden äh, dürfen, den Planeten mit jeder, jeden Tag kaputt zu machen, sozusagen aus, ähm, aus meiner Sicht bei solchen, bei solchen Produkten, sondern da muss es einfach sozusagen Rahmengebung geben, dass das der Planet in Zukunft auch belebbar sein wird. Und für die wirtschaftliche Welt würde das ähm, 
Also gehen wir sehr stark zum Beispiel auf, diese, auf marktbasierte Instrumente ein und gucken uns an, okay, wie viele dazu Jahrzehnte von marktbasierten Instrumenten, wie wirksam das eigentlich ist und was dabei sehr deutlich wird, ist, es ist nach wie vor der Ansatz, der am stärksten gefördert wird und trotzdem sind ja seit in diesen gleichen Jahrzehnten sind die Emissionen so stark, also es haben wir so viel ausgestoßen wie nie zuvor in der Geschichte der Menschheit. So. Und das hat verschiedene Gründe, aber sozusagen die Hoffnung darauf, dass sozusagen der Markt uns retten wird, wird, die ähm, habe ich verloren. Und äh, da ist sozusagen klar, dass die Rahmenbedingungen von der Politik kommen müssen und dass äh, sozusagen in der, in der Wirtschaft, also wirtschaftliche Akteure, da, deswegen habe ich das Beispiel Bosch genannt, ähm, auch viel machen können. Aber ich glaube, wir sollten uns nicht auf diese freiwilligen Selbstverpflichtungen verlassen. Das haben wir jetzt Jahrzehnte gemacht und es ist ein großer Teil dessen hat dazu beigetragen, dass wir... Ähm, auf den Klimakollaps, den wir gerade zusteuern, auf, auf dem Weg dorthin sind. Sie sind mir sehr dabei, dass Sie immer sagen, die Politik ist so stark in der Verantwortung, aber ja. wir sind ja eine Gesellschaft, jeder, wie Sie sagen, ist ja Konsument, die Unternehmen tragen diese Gesellschaft mit. Werden die alle entlassen? Müssen die alle, jetzt würde ich mal ein bisschen in der Richtung meiner Zeitung argumentieren, würde ich sagen, die müssen doch nicht alle bevormundet werden, wir sind doch alle mündige Bürger, ich weiß, was in den Produkten ist, vielleicht nicht in jedem Detail, aber ich kann mich doch kundig machen, ich muss kein SUV kaufen, ich kann ein Elektroauto kaufen und, 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 also wieso, wieso trauen Sie, dem, wieso trauen Sie dem, dem Verbraucher so wenig zu? Also ich, ähm, einmal möchte ich gerne die Menschen eben nicht sozusagen immer nur als Konsumentinnen und Konsumenten, sondern als Bürgerinnen und Bürger und äh, als, als Mensch irgendwie äh, sehen. Und, ähm, wenn ich, ähm, und das ist das, was eben ganz schnell in, in der Diskussion passiert, ist immer wieder auf diese Ebene des äh, Konsums runterzubrechen. Und die Frage des Nicht-Zutrauens, ähm, es, ist, es ist ja einfach eine massive Überforderung, ähm, sozusagen in diesem, in diesem Meer von Produkten ähm, sich also das sozusagen alles bei der Einzelperson abzuladen, zu sagen, das äh, soll dann irgendwie äh, sozusagen dann die Einzelperson auch entscheiden und ähm, damit liegt dann auch die Verantwortung dabei im Einzelnen, ob dann dieser Planet zugrunde geht, um zuzuspitzen äh, oder nicht. Und wo ich sagen würde, nein, wir sind eine Gesamtgesellschaft, wir haben ein politisches System und die Aufgabe von uns als Gesamtgesellschaft ist, uns Regeln zu geben, dass ein Leben in 10, 100 Jahren auf sozusagen ein Le eine lebenswerte Zukunft auch noch möglich ist. Und genau deswegen betonen wir diesen äh, Aspekt, halt dieses, also wir nennen das, ähm, die Klimakrise ist keine individuelle Krise. Das ist eines der Kapitel, weil wir sagen, es ist ähm, nicht auf der Ebene des Individuums, dass wir diese, diese ähm, Krise lösen werden, sondern vor allen Dingen dadurch, dass wir uns ähm, organisieren, zusammentun, und zu gucken, was irgendwie skalierbare Effekte sind. Und genau deswegen reagiere ich immer auf diese Art und Weise, weil, weil das eine der zentralen Erkenntnisse war. Wenn man sich anguckt, was, wie, wie diese Jahrzehnte, wo die hingeführt haben, es ist einfach, wir brauchen einen Fahrtwechsel in der Hinsicht. Kann uns der technische Fortschritt helfen? Der technische Fortschritt ist unerlässlich, natürlich, aber der kann uns nicht alleine helfen. Also das ist, ich bin wirklich, ich habe zu viel gekriegt, als AKK irgendwie losgelassen hat letzte Woche, diese Klimahysterie, ich kann sie gar nicht verstehen, wir werden das technisch lösen. Ich habe gesagt, ich glaube es nicht. Es ist dieser, dieser, dieser Irrglaube, dass wir den, was hat Sascha Lobo mal gesagt, den, den Einhorn, den CO, das CO2-fressende Einhorn erfinden wird. Nein, wir werden es nicht erfinden. Wir haben CO2-fressende Wesen und die heißen Pflanzen und die heißen Bäume und die heißen ähm, große, also Algen, ähm, das Meer, ich habe schon mal als äh, Kohlenstoffsenke bezeichnet und als Speicher dann Bäume wachsen und das ist im Holz gespeichert, das ist ein Kohlenstoffspeicher, holt CO2 aus der Luft. Ich glaube, da hat da jemand irgendwie den Kindergarten verpasst und die Grundschule, das sind äh, Erkenntnisse von vor 200 Jahren mit dem schönen Presley-Versuch, mit dem Mäuschen und dem Pflänzchen in einem äh, geschlossenen Glas und einmal dem Mäuschen und der Kerze, äh, das funktioniert nicht und wir sind alle alle ähm, äh, äh, tierischen Wesen, wozu die Menschen auch gehören, die stößen das CO2 aus und alle pflanzlichen Wesen atmen es ein. Und wenn das out of balance ist, dann wird der ähm, Planet auch kippen. Da können wir sonstige Techniken äh, erfinden, wie wir wollen. Weil alle Technik, die wir erfinden, ist nur eine Technik, die weniger CO2 emittiert. 
kompensieren können nur Pflanzen. Das wird auch immer falsch äh, kommuniziert. Also alleine die Technik wird es nicht tun. Und jetzt dieser irrsinnige Wahn der Gebäudedämmung, ähm, mit der wir Tonnen von ver hochvergiftetem Plastik auf Gebäude klatschen, das dann äh, ein Sondermüll ist, der, wo niemand weiß, wie das entsorgt werden muss. Und solche dicken äh, Platten, die da drauf... Äh, Styropor? Äh, Styroporplatten, Styropor äh, die da drauf geklatscht werden. Und äh, die sind äh, durchtränkt von Giften, von äh, Fungiziden, eben weil sonst das Haus anfängt zu schimmeln und auch von Brandschutzflüssigkeiten. Äh, Alles reine kann nur auf der Giftmülldeponie äh, dann entsorgt werden. Und das ist natürlich auch diese Herstellung des Ganzen ein unglaublich CO2-treibender Faktor. Und das hält nicht ewig. Und es gibt äh, Erkenntnisse von äh, Hochschule Zürich, äh, dass das auch nur bei den 50er-Jahren-Gebäuden, also Nachkriegsgebäuden, die sehr billig gebaut wurden, äh, wirklich effizient ist. Und ich muss im Herbst nicht die Heizung aufdrehen und äh, dann im Frühjahr erst wieder abdrehen. Ich kann es auch regulieren. Und sowas kann man natürlich dann auch über eine Bepreisung regulieren oder Maximum oder irgendwie. Also diese Technik, Vertrautheit, Verliebtheit, von der müssen wir uns auch verabschieden. Also Sie sind sich eigentlich beide einig, es müssen Rahmenbedingungen gestellt werden von der Politik. Wie stark brauchen wir noch Fridays for Future? Wie lange müssen die noch auf die Straße gehen? Die müssen noch eine ganze Weile auf die Straße gehen. Der Aufschrei muss so laut sein, dass jeder Klimaleugner nachts nicht mehr schlafen kann und es wirklich verstanden hat, dass alles zusammenhängt und die Welt wirklich abstürzen wird. Wir werden alle sterben oder nicht alle. Der wir können auch nicht auf den Mond ausweichen oder auf irgendeinen Planeten, wofür Forschungsmillionen ausgegeben werden. Da werden 30 Millionen in Europa ausgegeben, die Amis, die Russen, die Chinesen im Gleichen, wie der Mensch den Winterschlaf, äh, in den Winterschlaf kommen kann, um zum Mars zu fliegen, um uns den Planeten B zu bauen. Das finde ich einen absoluten Irrsinn, wenn wir das Geld nehmen würden, um hier etwas zu tun, statt zu forschen, wie wir irgendwie auf Planet X kommen und da noch eine zweite Erde bauen. Herr Rappinich, wie lange sind Sie noch auf der Straße persönlich? Sie sind jetzt 30, sehen wir Sie mit 35, mit 40 noch auf der Straße oder wie wird das laufen? Was ist Ihre Prognose? Na, wir sind äh, angetreten mit dem äh, Motto oder dem Spruch, wir streiken bis ihr handelt und das, was äh, jetzt am 20. September passiert ist, war, ist auf jeden Fall nicht das, äh, was, was reicht und insofern wird auf jeden Fall die, die Bewegung weitergehen, die Organisation und ähm, es, gibt ja, es wächst ja auch weiter, es gibt jetzt weitere Bewegungen, die sich auch organisieren. Vorhin wurde hier von Extinction Rebellion gesprochen, der, der, wo das jetzt auch zu viel, ähm, Organ zu viel Diskussionen gerade führt und viel Aufmerksamkeit erzeugt. Und ähm, es ist schwer eine Prognose zu geben, aber dass die Klimakrise wird uns ähm, sicherlich unser Leben lang auf die eine oder andere Be Weise begleiten, aber ich, die in der Hoffnung, dass eben wir von zu einem Krisenmanagement kommen irgendwann in naher Zukunft und nicht eben mit den ganzen Folgen und den Kipppunkten, die uns dann erwarten und den Feedback-Loops äh, zu kämpfen haben, sondern dass wir jetzt schnell reduzieren und zwar in dem Umfang, wie es, äh, wie es notwendig ist. Ganz herzlichen Dank für den Appell und überhaupt, dass Sie uns als Bewegung wirklich wachgerüttelt haben. Das muss man Ihnen ja, und, eingestehen. Ja, und ich würde auch gerne uns, nachliefern, also ähm, es wird eben häufig als eine äh, Jugendbewegung oder die jungen Menschen, die gehen jetzt auf die Straße. Ich bin mit meinem Alter so in der, äh, in der sozusagen dazwischen irgendwo. Ähm, aber äh, was eben total entscheidend ist, ist, dass als äh, sozusagen sich gesamtgesellschaftlich auch Menschen aufgerufen fühlen. Äh, deswegen am 29. November werden wir wieder werden wir zum vierten globalen Klimastreik äh, auch mobilisieren. Und da erwarte ich, hoffe ich, dass sich möglichst viele von hier auch auch wiedersehe, weil es ist eben eine gesamtgesellschaftliche Aufgabe und nicht die Jungen werden es richten und äh, so. Also, und vor allem muss es jetzt passieren. Herzlichen Dank. Herzlichen Dank an die Runde und die Bücher, Sie haben sie gesehen. Ja, ich wollte auch noch, frei, ich, um no, auf noch einen Abschlussdank sagen hier an diese Veranstaltung, was ich ganz großartig finde und ich habe es auch eine Künstlerin hier gesehen, ähm, Elke Zielsatz, dass jetzt eben diese Bewegung auch in der Kunst angekommen ist und sie hat ein ganz tolles Kunstwerk gemacht, ich habe das gerade verliehen zum Thema Meeresschutz und es sind immer mehr Künstler, die das Thema aufgreifen und jetzt auch in den Museen und das ist etwas, wenn äh, das in der Kunst angekommen ist, dann ist das in der DNA der Gesellschaft angekommen ein Thema und dafür ist die Buchmesse auch eine ganz großartige Plattform, danke dafür. Herzlichen Dank.
Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you for that wonderful session. We're going to move on to, from climate change to SDG number four on quality education. Uh, our next segment is reading about the SDGs and I have the pleasure to welcome our next two speakers, Ms. Liz Page, the Executive Director of the International Board of Books for Young People and Mr. Hugo Setzer, the President of the International Publishers Association and the CEO of Manuel Moderno, who will join us on stage for the panel discussion with my colleague Arna. Let us warmly welcome Ms. Page and Mr. Setzer. wherever you would like. Okay. Arna's on. <laughs> Yeah, good morning everyone once more from the uh, podium. I've been given the honor to um, introduce three wonderful speakers for our next session entitled Reading about the SDGs, Liz Page, Hugo Setzer and my colleague Sherry Elders. Uh, once more a very warm welcome to all of you. Let me briefly introduce our panelists. Uh, to my left, Liz Page is the executive director of IBBY, the International Board on Books for Young People. IBBY is an international non-profit whose mission is to promote literacy and access to high-quality children's books worldwide, as well as stimulate research and scholarly works in the field of children's literature. Ms. Page was a founding member of Yuki Bu, the Intercultural Children's Library in Basel, Switzerland. She was later elected president of the Intercultural Children's Libraries Association of Switzerland. To her left, our second speaker, Mr. Hugo Setzer, is the president of IPA the International Publishers Association, the world's largest federation of national, regional, and specialist publishers associations, and chief executive officer of publishing house Manuel Moderno. Mr. Setzer has traveled the world speaking at events and seminars promoting literacy and empowerment through reading. He is dedicated to the publication of high quality works and has brought together publishing firms worldwide to emphasize to policymakers the importance of choice, local solutions, and collaboration in order to build smarter generations. What a task. <laughs> um, and uh, to his left, uh, today's host, uh, Sherry Aldis, you've already met in our previous sessions, the Chief of United Nations Publications, which operates within the UN Department of Global Communications. Thank you all for uh, being with us today. Let's begin. Um, my first question goes to, to Liz. What is uh, most important uh, from your point of view to consider when using books for children to teach about the Sustainable Development Goals? Oh well, this morning this is working. This is this is what we need to know. Uh, this is very important for the young generation now, especially for young children, and we need to make them attractive, clear message, no confusing messages, no contradictory messages, but I think high quality, especially with the illustrations and the message. This is very important, so they actually um, can get through the message at a very early age. From your point of view, uh, Hugo Setzer, what could be the right recipe? Thank you. Uh, let me perhaps just start by saying that we are really proud to be able to collaborate with the UN in this uh, project. It's really fantastic to be able to have books on the Sustainable Development Goals in every of the six uh, official UN languages. That means that a child in, uh, in Lima, Peru, can be reading in, in their own language, in Spanish, as well as a child in Shanghai, a child in Moscow. So it's, it's, it's really amazing to have a project like this. And uh, yeah, I, I also agree that 
one of the things is that there are uh, quality books. I mean, there's so much being published by all our members worldwide, uh, and especially children's books is uh, such a thriving sector of publishing, and there are so many books to choose from. I mean, we were just discussing that for some of the uh, goals, it's perhaps kind of tricky to, to get the, the, the books we're looking for, but in general, uh, we really do have a lot being, being published in, in quality books. So I think that's one of the most important things, that it's, that it's easy for, for children. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, we were firstly thinking of having one book per language, and we came out having several uh, per language because it's not the same to have a book for a four-year-old than for an eight-year-old and for a 12-year-old. So we have had some uh, uh, other titles there as well. Sherry, when it comes to uh, media consumption, books is one thing, television, DVDs, Netflix is another. How can we encourage more children to join book clubs? So there's a lot of competition for people's attention, for children's attention, for all of our attention. Um, so that's clearly an issue for publishing in general, uh, and more and more for children's books. I agree absolutely with Hugo and Liz that it's very important to have the books be attractive, be interactive, and also be present in the places where children are looking for reading materials. So it doesn't necessarily mean that books have to be in print, they can be in interactive forms, they can be in digital forms. Um, the main thing is to make books as accessible as possible to as many children as possible. You know, SDG 4 about quality education is about literacy, it's about educating children. So it is about making this information available wherever children are looking for it. Um, it's one of the reasons, just to come back to what Hugo was saying, why we have created the Sustainable Development Goals Book Club for Children. Um, is really to engage them from a very young age with the themes of the Sustainable Development Goals, which can be quite complicated concepts. So finding children's books that really address these themes in a fun way, in an interesting way, in an engaging way, is what we're trying to do and share that in as many languages as possible. So the six UN official languages and also other languages. Um, from your expert view, a question to, to all of all of you, why is uh, literacy important to achieve the sustainable development goals? Well, well, I think uh, in order to to uh, to progress in general as humanity, we need literacy. We need to, uh, to be able to read and to understand what we're reading, and it's closely related, of course, to the sustainable development goals. It's not enough just to, and, and I totally agree that there's a lot of competition with other media, but it's not just enough. And the, the, the brain processes the information in a different way if we just look at the TV, that if we read that information. So it's very important that we also use books for that. Mm -hmm. And Well, I also I agree completely, and it's a very exciting project. But I think literacy is also, it goes hand in hand with all the other media, as Jerry said. But literacy is over, um, it's universal, universally acceptable, and it's universally found. I mean, you might not have a television in a village in the middle of the Sahara, but you might have books, or you might have a way of having books. I mean, that's not completely um, valid either, because there's not always books, but it's just a start. And if we can do this and have books, they are, can be found everywhere. Yeah. Maybe, Sherry, if you could add to this, uh Literacy is important, but what causes illiteracy worldwide? Well, I think access to information, access to books. I think libraries are very important. Obviously, there's a question related to, to development, to policy in different governments around the world, and making transportation available to get children to school, uh, making sure that the, they have quality health care as well in order that they have healthy lives, that they have enough to eat in order to go to school. But there are many factors. It's one of the things that is so important about the SDGs is that they are really interconnected. You can't have one without the others. And one of the reasons why we're participating in the Future of Culture Festival is because culture underpins all of that. And literacy, obviously, is a very, very important fundamental component of that. Thank you. 
let's look uh, a little bit towards the work of your individual organizations. How are your organizations adapting to digitization and the increasing chances of children not choosing physical books? Well, IBI is a, a membership organization, as you know, and we have 80 member countries all around the world, and they approach this in all different ways. So we can have um, very often across on the African continent, um, most children have access to mobile phones with solar energy and stuff like that. So they're looking at ways of putting stories on mobile phones for children or radio programs. So I think it's, it's, it's too broad a question to have in 10 minutes. It's a, it's a huge topic in many different ways, but I think it's this interactive um, aspect of literacy and books and using all the media available. And I think people are waking up to that, that they can use everything. Literacy covers everything. Are there any other examples, Hugo? Well, we, we are definitely in the uh, publishing community. Publishers, uh, I would say publishers globally, are already engaged in uh, and have embraced uh, new technology and are working on e-books as well in all genres, uh, and particularly in children's books, of course, which is kind of uh, complicated and tricky to produce uh, good uh, children's book in electronic and digital files in electronic format as an e-book. But I think there are many excellent examples of what publishers are doing. However, we, I personally think it's uh, very important to maintain both versions. I mean, uh, children are uh, reaching out to, to other formats, but it's very important to read and in print version as well. Uh, I won't go into detail into that, but Marianne Wolf, uh, who wrote an excellent book about this, t speaks about the biliteral brain so that to raise children nowadays, it is important that they are able to use not only the new technology, but they continue reading print material. Is there one general recommendation you would give to publishers? Uh, well, I mean, especially to embrace technology and to, 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 to if, they, if there are publishers who haven't started producing ebooks, I, I think it's very important to do that. I don't see uh, ebooks necessarily displacing uh, printed books, but there will be a need for ebooks, absolutely, and there will be a coexistence, in my point of view, of both uh, kind of books in the future, and there is already there. Let's move on, Cherry, to the SDG Book Club. Um, that's a very important UN initiative. How do you involve uh, also adults in the SDG book club, what is, what is their specific role in this? So adults are an extremely important component of the SDG book club. Uh, we need adults to engage with children to help us select the books to start with for the, for the SDG book club. It's a, it's a reading list. We need adults in the six official languages of the United Nations as well as many other languages to be able to you know, guide the choice um, around the different SDGs. We need teachers obviously, librarians, booksellers, authors, parents, everybody is involved in this. It's, I think what is very strong about the SDGs is it's grounded in civil society, in personal engagement, everybody needs to contribute to this. And we really do work very hard to engage with anybody who has contact with children and encourage them to read to their children or with their children about these themes. Um, so we engage through social media, we engage in person, um, we engage through events like this. We also, for example, we have um, a bookshop at the United Nations headquarters in, in New York and we host reading sessions where we have adults reading to children. Um, and one of the things that, that we plan to do as at the end of this uh, adventure and for the fifth anniversary of the SDGs is to have a worldwide read to a child event to encourage adults around the globe to read to their children in public or private settings to really amplify this movement and have a, an, an impulse going forward. And related to, with, to this, how do you ensure access to the books is inclusive? So that's a very good question. Um, it's, we recommend the titles. We try and select titles that are available in as many formats as possible. So digital and print. Um, 
a lot of children's books are available in print, and that's important for the digital divide as well. As Liz said, in some places it's not easy to have digital access, so we try and make sure they're available in as many formats as possible, including wherever possible in accessible versions for people with learning disabilities, physical disabilities. That's also very important to us, accessibility as wide as possible. Let's get back to the uh, sustainable development goals directly. How do you impact list the SDGs directly through your efforts to encourage children and also adults to, to read? That's a very difficult question as well because um, we rely on our members to reach them and then spread the word through their um, organizations in their country. Every section of IBI is autonomous. So we have this reach across the world, especially with the six languages, but it's more than six countries. It's many, it's many, uh, it reaches many, many people. The impact, well, we're trying to encourage through what Sherry says, through social media and everything, and try and uh, encourage people to have book clubs. And actually, uh, I think the biggest challenge first is to make people aware. This is the huge challenge, to make people aware, and then you can have the impact that you're looking for. And hopefully by the end of next year, when we've been through all 17, people will see it and then we'll see the impact growing as these months go by. And I think that's very important to be aware of these things. I was uh, just thinking I'll get back to the question, but uh, Sherry mentioned something and now Liz mentioned it uh, yeah. as well, yeah. which I think is very important to that. And that is that we started with the six official UN languages as a starter, and it's uh, complicated enough to, to get this project uh, on its feet with the six official languages. But I've been traveling to many countries, uh, visiting our member associations, uh, publishers from different parts of the world in other countries uh, that uh, don't have uh, one of the six official languages. And they are very eager also to work on having something similar. So we are preparing a kind of a toolkit for for uh, stakeholders, for publishers and librarians and what have you in other countries to also uh, do some work. So we are expecting to have um, in many other languages those books available as well. And uh, in the case of, of publishers, we were considering for some time how to impact the SDGs. And well, one of the most obvious for us is quality education. And we have been working a lot on quality education. And you quoted some of the things we think are important uh, at the beginning for quality education. But that, that is something we like so much about this project because it allows us to impact on all 17 of the uh, uh, SDGs. From uh, theory to action, the SDGs is about taking action when they are done reading. Uh, how can they take action? So for each uh, SDGs, after we publish the list, we also provide details on concrete actions that children can take. So it's really written for the children uh, in their daily lives. So whether it's about no poverty or zero hunger, good health and well-being, we give them ideas for actions in their communities, in their classrooms, with their friends, and individually that really can impact things. And that's been very favorably welcomed by children. We have a lot of very positive feedback, um, interaction on social media, and through our blog, there are some, I would invite you to look at the, at the um, SDG Book Club website and see some of the activities in the blog that children are engaging in around the world thanks to this. Before we wrap up, um, what other resources are available out there for people to read and learn about the SDGs? Uh, well, I think Sherry has the monopoly on this. <laughs> she has many resources. It's amazing. And we're very, very pleased to be part of this project. And we will use their resources and hopefully spread them around the world. Thank you. We do, obviously, at the United Nations, we publish a lot of content about the SDGs. We're certainly leaders um, in terms of reports, monitoring um, a lot of the statistics and, um, and databases and also research that goes into and behind the Sustainable Development Goals are published on the United Nations platforms. We have a platform called the UN iLibrary and recently um, there was the launch of a, a tool, an AI tool called the SDG Pathfinder 
So you, some of this body of work is very complicated. The concepts themselves are complicated, and it's really our challenge and our job to make sure that it becomes accessible to everybody and you know, easily digestible. So we're trying to make this as user-friendly as possible and aggregating things onto platforms and using AI tools to, um, to be able to navigate through this very large body of work, us and other IGOs. OK, thank you very much for your time and your inputs, and uh, the best of luck uh, for this important initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arna. Thank you. Head. No, please go. Yes. Start. Very first introduction in Germany. Just a few sentences. Um, willkommen bei uh, diesem Panel. Die nächsten 25 Minuten Good to see werden you. wir Thank uns. Thank you so much. Yeah. Die nächsten 25 Minuten werden wir uns unterhalten über die Rolle, die Städte haben, wenn es um die Frage geht, wie die SDG umgesetzt werden. Städte haben eine ganz besondere Rolle in der heutigen Zeit, vor allem deshalb, weil auch Kultur sehr viel in Städten oder hauptsächlich in Städten stattfindet, dort geregelt wird. Darüber werden wir reden mit den beiden Bürgermeistern von Mannheim. Herr Dr. Peter Kurz ist hier und Martin Krupa, der Bürgermeister von der Stadt Katowice, ist hier. Now I'm switching to English um, because this is what the panel language will be. And um, Dr. Peter Kurz and uh, Martin Krupa, please welcome on stage. Maybe here in, in, in the center. Okay. And before we start, I have a present for you. Um, because you know that we've been um, speaking during the last days here a lot with activists, um, mostly cultural activists, and one of their statements that we liked so much, we put that on a sticker. So here's one sticker for you, and here's one you, and the sticker says, culture reaches areas that politics never reach. So, I mean, it might be a bit weird to discuss that with politicians, actually, but you're not politicians, okay. Um, uh, so I think while we are going to talk about it, um, it will also be clear that this is actually nothing that, that uh, makes you afraid of things, but probably supports what you're already doing, right? Um, so, you just added a few moments ago when we talked about um, what we're going to talk at that panel, um, something really weird. You added that in the SDG, we don't even mention culture. So we should also talk about why culture still plays a role within, uh, 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 plays a role within um, the whole SDG framework. And you also said something else that I found um, really interesting, and um, that addressed the role that you have as mayors and as citizens in this whole game. So Dr. Peter Kurz, maybe you could um, start with, um, with what you just uh, mentioned before. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for, for having us, and uh, I think it's an opportunity to uh, stress the importance of the local uh, level for realizing the uh, SDGs, and uh, to say it uh, maybe in, in that way, I think that uh, mayors and local officials are maybe uh, the most important uh, job family for realizing the SDGs. And uh, if we speak about um, the SDGs, you fin find one SDG, it's SDG 11. And I think uh, this is uh, a special goal because this goal is cross-sectoral. It, uh, it has a connection to all other goals and is a, a, a horizontal goal. And if you want to have sustainable cities, uh, um, then you have to realize the um, other 16 goals, of course. 
And uh, if you want to have a sustainable world, you have to realize SDG 11. So for me, it's really a central goal. And if you uh, look to the sub-targets, it's 169 uh, sub-targets. Nearly 80% of the sub-targets are related to the local level. So without the local level, uh, um, there is uh, no progress. And uh, there is one other uh, advantage for the local level. I think the local level is uh, um, thinking uh, in a more spatial dimension and a spatial dimension is automatically uh, a cross-sectoral thinking uh, dimension. And uh, so that's why I think uh, mayors are our natural partners for the whole uh, SDG uh, movement. And what is also important is, uh, also in other topics, we, we realize that nation states sometimes become dysfunctional and that multilateralism is a, is a question and cities know that we are all are interdependent. So uh, there is a growing movement of, of uh, cities um, to play a more important uh, international role and of course especially to realize the SDGs. Mm -hmm. Also, the Global Parliament of Mayors, of course, is a big, uh, plays a big role within what you just mentioned. And you, you just said that on a local level, you are actually doing all the work. So let's dive into that local level. And I want to ask you, what can you learn from each other? So what can Katowice learn from Mannheim, maybe, as a start? I think a lot of, but uh, I think the uh, first um, uh, very good uh, idea is Mannheim has developed impressive standards of public-private partnerships. Uh, Mr. Uh, Peter Kurz, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, has perfectly integrated business and the cultural, uh, cultural life of the city. Um, it is a good practice that Katowice is willing to implement too. Uh, besides, I have been uh, inspired by the Startup Mannheim um, uh, program. Uh, I've already started to prepare uh, support for young businessmen, uh, so I really value the uh, comprehensive and strategic approach employment by Mannheim in that uh, field. Yeah. It is very important for us, but, but we cooperate uh, with the different levels. Uh, not only in this, but we uh, go in the in the when in the in the in the, in the or, uh, cities, different cities, and we look what is good for us, and uh, exactly uh, we do maybe not the same, but uh, very similar things in our cities. I I really like it that you that you choose the opportunity to learn from each other and. Um, that by working together in um, institutions like the Global Parliament of Mayors, we're also making visible um, what is happening in one city, what is probably not copied, but uh, where another city was inspired by something. So um, what is happening in Katowice that inspires you? What you can learn um, from Katowice? Yeah. It's really about uh, inspiration um, between uh, cities and uh, what we admire. Uh, regarding Katowice is really in a rather short period of time uh, the transformation of the city um, from a mining city to a city of culture and uh, uh, yeah and, and, and uh, also I think uh, inwards and uh, um, also uh, the message was placed outwards and, and uh, this is especially impressive uh, so Katowice uh, started a few years ago with huge international events. Uh, the first was, or the first uh, I realized was uh, the World uh, Music Expo. Uh, then the next was uh, um, the uh, world meeting of uh, the Creative City Network uh, of the UNESCO. So we are both cities of the UNESCO network. Uh, so this is also a platform for, let's say, cities uh, which are ambitious. So Katowice is, is an extremely ambitious city. Uh, it has a, a holistic approach uh, and a comprehensive uh, a strategy. And then, of course, uh, the uh, COP24 uh, was in uh, Katowice and the World Urban Forum will be the next of the, uh, in 2020. Uh, 2022, so, uh, uh, World Urban Forum will be in, in Katowice. 
and uh, we didn't dare to apply for <laughs> being the host uh, of the World Urban Forum. And, and so I was really impressed uh, uh, that Katowice did it and succeeded, and I'm looking uh, very much forward to, to be in uh, Katowice in 2022 during the World Urban Forum. So you're also inspired by the braveness, yes. right, uh, to, to apply for that. Absolutely. Um, you, you already mentioned um, two or three um, cultural initiatives that uh, started in Katowice. So I'm really interested in um, what are you actually doing to support and promote cultural uh, initiatives and activities in your city? Uh, yeah, we do a lot of. Uh, the role of the um, uh, city is to offer uh, its residents interesting cultural um, uh, life, yes. It is the, the residents and their needs that inspires you to start different activities. Um, we have to listen to their options and create chance to develop more. As Katowice has the title of UNESCO City of Music, yeah? and I'd like uh, to say a few words about the musical uh, project. But it is only, I will be say about two, but we have a lot of difference. Um, one of them is uh, the focus on uh, young talent. Uh, we promotion of young, young uh, cultural creators. It's a project where we financially support art schools. We finance a workshop and performance abroad for young talent artists. Uh, the second is um, District Sand Good. Uh, it is the project for young bands uh, who can perform in front of a, a big audience for the first time in their lives, yes. They can also use a recording studio and, and uh, oh. ask um, organizers. Uh, we give financial support for various types of music festivals. For example, for the new music, for the um, uh, new sound, uh, blues, um, uh, classic music. Everyone can find uh, something uh, from himself. We want to create an opportunity for Katowice residents to get uh, familiar uh, with the city music uh, culture. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of initiatives, and I'm quite sure that all these initiatives cost money, right? Yes. So, and um, I expect that both of your cities um, probably also have a budget. Um, and um, probably within your budget, um, there are some trade-offs to make between the different um, segments of these budgets. So, how do you make a, how do you decide um, between culture and other um, policy priorities that you all have in your cities? Um, yeah, how do you how do you make that? I, I imagine that being one of the toughest um, tasks probably for a mayor. We see culture as a driver for city development. And this is a, a paradigm shift. So um, culture is not, let's say, uh, the flower on the jacket. Uh, it's uh, a driver and a basic tool. And uh, when I was vice mayor for culture, I realized that many other departments uh, rely on culture uh, to promote uh, their goals. Um, so culture reaches uh, um, areas that politics never reach. My experience was that uh, other areas, education, um, uh, city planning, uh, um, economic development, uh, never reach. And, and so they, they used uh, also, uh, let's say, cultural formats um, uh, to uh, reach their goals. and. Uh, and this is also an answer for your bu um, budget question, because one driver for innovation is uh, gross budgeting or combined budgeting from different areas. So we expanded uh, in that time our, exp uh, our expansions for, uh, for culture, uh, but not only, um, let's say, uh, um, in the area of culture, but also with the mon money from other uh, areas. Uh, one of the first projects uh, we started in that regard uh, was really to think about budget. Uh, that there was a, a program of the EU um, for regional development, and we thought, how could we participate as a cultural department for, from this program? 
and we established uh, the first German uh, music industry incubator. And uh, uh, so we combined uh, music industry and, and, of course, economic development. And uh, uh, this was the starting point uh, for our, our uh, whole creative uh, city uh, strategy. And uh, it has a lot of effects on, on different areas. Uh, let me uh, tell you one, one example, maybe. Uh, we had a, uh, a private initiative. It's called Oriental Music Academy. And, uh, um, and we don't see, let's say, new initiatives as something uh, which disturbs us. Uh, we wanted these initiatives, and uh, uh, we look for the uh, potential, and we look for co-creation. This Oriental Music Academy, uh, in the end, led to a, a um, new master uh, degree uh, in world music in, in, uh, in Mannheim. It uh, had a lot of uh, um, impact uh, on the neighborhood. Uh, it changed uh, um, also really the, uh, the image of the neighborhood. Uh, and uh, it did a lot for, for the youngsters uh, in, in this uh, area of the city. So it, it was multidimensional uh, in its uh, effects. And I, I think this is typical. And, and so now, culture is much less questioned uh, than, let's uh, say, 20 years ago, and it's not seen only as uh, linked to institutions. I, I wrote that actually down, what you just said, culture is a basic tool um, for city development, so we will print that on a t-shirt as well. Um, so we talked about the budget, um, we talked about some of the projects, but I'm really interested also in how do you measure the impact um, that culture has on on the on the city development. Um, can you measure the impact of culture? Yes, but maybe not uh, so di di directly. But uh, the important use point of, uh, in our city is the UNESCO title. Is the impl uh, is uh, to uh, especially the implementation of the Art uh, 13. Yes which integrates cultural life with cities' uh, development policies. Yeah? Uh, use the experience from COP24 uh, and the preparation for World Urban Forum uh, 2022. We observe how the new urban agenda and the 70 goals um, campaign can be integrated into the organization of strategies and cultural events. Uh, the transformation of the post-industrial area in Katowice into the culture zone which the NOSP, uh, Inter uh, National um, Symphonic Orchestra and the International Congress Center and the Museum, Salesian Museum, shows the importance of uh, sustainable development of uh, cities and their communities. Organizing Cult, uh, cultural events uh, also the activities the education or citizens via art. Um, to be effective and uh, to reach uh, all goals. It's important to cooperate, to use the knowledge and experience of uh, private and public sectors, what I said uh, before. Yeah? As well as uh, uh, scientific and uh, cultural communities. We really centrally included the 70 goals campaign in the future policies of uh, Katowice. But we measure the, um, what uh, is the impact uh, in the money when um, we have the ghost uh, in, in our city. Yeah? One person, when come to the city uh, from the one day, uh, they spell the, um, uh, about 160 slot. Is the about uh, 40 euro for the one day. Uh, if, if we have uh, one million people in the year, uh, it is uh, the very big budget, yeah? but when the person stay more as the one day, for example, two on third, is this 600 slot, is the about 150 euro per day, yeah? per, 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 the, 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 per day, yes, exactly. Yeah? And it is uh, really good uh, uh, business. Yeah? Culture is business for the city, for the citizens, for the for the uh, all uh, sectors. What we have in in, in our city. Yeah? 
So I will add that to a t-shirt as well. Culture is business. So um, in the end, we'll come up with a mayor's collection of our revolution um, t-shirts. Um, so here at the Frankfurter Buchmesse, we have visitors from over 120 um, countries. And um, maybe it's a short pitch, um, like in one minute, um, why should these visitors visit your city of uh, Katowice, um, Mr. Krupa? What are the, like, the maybe three to five most yeah. important reasons? Yeah, we are the city um, uh, which is um, very dynamic now, yes? Uh, we um, uh, do something, new buildings, new areas, new, um, uh, new um, places. Uh, for the citizen for, and, and for the for the guest, um, uh, yeah, we um, uh, associate with the coal mining and a uh, very uh, heavy industry uh, a few years ago. But uh, now we everything changing for the um, uh, good quality um, uh, city with the good good quality uh, life. Um, so nowadays the post-industrial area is the set of the concert hall, what I said, a museum and the International Congress Center. Uh, we, in um, uh, 2022, we will be have the uh, new conference, international conference, UN uh, um, World Urban Forum. And uh, it is uh, maybe this thing uh, what we uh, have now for the proposition for the for the other people in the all the world i'm sold and um katowice also has a very nice mayor so um i think i'll come by this year yeah. um thank you very much um mr krupa thank you um, very much herr dr kurz often uh, ihnen warum sollte ich also mein mann ist ein bisschen näher yeah um for me um but for some people mannheim might be a trip why should they take that trip I think what's special about Mannheim, uh, in comparison to other German city, cities, it's an extremely diverse city. Uh, and it's a city uh, where you can feel at home uh, within a very short period of time, even, even without, uh, within days. Uh, I once had a... Uh, a dialogue with a rather famous uh, German artist and uh, he told me there is only one city outside of Berlin uh, when I, where I uh, not was questioned uh, because of my look in the streets uh, and, and this was Mannheim. So it's a very uh, tolerant uh, um, city and as I said uh, you can feel as a part of it uh, within a very short period, period of time and if you leave you will have a sense of longing. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you very much um, to the two mayors of Mannheim and um, Katowice for being here with us and um, sharing some insights uh, into your cities. Um, I don't know, will you be around for the next minutes if people have questions and want to approach you? Would that be okay for you? Wonderful. So thank Maybe you very yes. much for this panel. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very interesting discussion. Thank you for your, for your ideas, for your engagement. I think that's been our theme today is how important local engagement, local activism is to get global results. Um, thank you to Memory. She's still in the audience with us here. And um, I'm just sharing your knowledge and your experience so generously with everybody else really is the way forward in this global conversation. It allows us to share experiences and best practices and to make well-informed decisions in the future to achieve the 2030 agenda together. It's about all of us. It's not just about the United Nations, it's every single one of us. Um, it's spaces like this that allow us as a global community to find solutions. And I thank you all for your interest, for your participation, and have a wonderful Frankfurt Book Fair. <laughs>